Welcome to the 700 Club Canada. Thanks for joining us. If there's one thing we all struggle with, it's from time to time, it's the illusion of control. Even when we think we've got everything under control, we're only kidding ourselves, right? We really are. And one area we can't fully control is our mind. And here's the test to prove it. Close your eyes, but don't think of an orange. I bet you can do it. <laughs> Guess what I thought of. What did you think of? <laughs> an orange. Yeah. <laughs> So true, right? I kind of thought so. Yeah, you know, exactly. one of the things about that, especially neuroscience has mm -hmm. proven that when we have a dominant thought, and usually when we see something, yeah. and even subliminally, you know, people, you cannot help yeah, but think those I things. I know, I know. Made you blink, right? Yeah, yeah I made know. Me blink, but I made you blink, too. Yeah. <laughs> Another area that we can't fully control is our emotions. If we could, then we would never have to worry or feel anxious about anything again. Well, that is so true. Well, the, you know... Um, we have freedom, you know, to not, I guess, be in control, right? <laughs> Isn't that our greatest freedom? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you know, I think so. I, do. I, You know, one thing I, I believe, especially with the life that we have in Christ, is the wonderful gift of not having to control everything. Right, and I right, think that's exactly. the beauty of it. Mm -hmm. So if we think Christ is the dominant thought, yeah. now we know who's in control. Right. And the fruit of the Spirit. Yes. You know, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, and... Self-control. So it comes from the Spirit. Yes. In and of ourself, it's pretty impossible. On today's yes. program, you'll see how the lust for money took control over William to the point where he owed millions. I'm serious. And you'll see why he turned himself in and turned his life over to God. And apologist Andy Bannister, he has a fascinating segment on whether science has done anything to disprove God. But first, this is what happened to Kayla when she stopped trying to do things on her own and put her trust in God instead. It's really good. Mm -hmm. Growing up on California's Central Coast, Kayla Diaz longed for a family. My childhood was pretty lonely. My dad got murdered when I was one, and so I always grew up missing him and wanting him, and I had a pretty hard childhood. As a single parent, her mom struggled to cope. She tried to be there as much as she could, but drugs had a hold on her, and alcohol had a hold on her, and relationships with men had a hold on her, so she was never really fully there. What I was afraid of as a child is that my mom would get taken from me how my dad did. I was afraid of being alone. Kayla found some security and acceptance with her peers, but they weren't the best influence on her. By sixth grade, she was using marijuana and getting drunk on a regular basis. Drinking and smoking marijuana led to me fighting, led to me not caring about school, ditching school. It led to me having anger towards other people. After one particular fight in eighth grade, she was ordered to anger management counseling. Yeah, I remember telling my counselor that I wanted to have a baby. And, and she asked me why. And I said that because I want to be able to love someone and have them love me and nothing could ever take that away. So I was already in my mind trying to build the family that I always wanted. So at 14, Kayla got pregnant but it didn't turn out like she planned. She moved in with her boyfriend who became physically and emotionally abusive toward her and her child. Kayla saw no way out. I tried to leave a few times and it just wouldn't, he wouldn't let me. Tell me it would kill me if I left. He would just put, put so much fear in me and I feared that I wouldn't be able, even though it was such an unhealthy relationship, I felt like I wouldn't be able to make it. I wasn't in that relationship. Since he was also a meth addict, Kayla hoped she could stop the abuse by using drugs with him. Once I started using them, especially meth, it took everything I had. It took all of my self-respect. I stopped caring about myself completely when I started using meth. That's when I felt that I deserved to get hit. Like, I felt like I was doing wrong, so I deserved wrong things to happen to me. The next few years were a chaotic blur of drugs and abuse. By the time she was 23, Kayla and her boyfriend had five children together. But she was too busy trying to get high to take care of them. I didn't care.
care about any kind of family then. I stopped even caring fully about my kids and what they were thinking or feeling. And, and I just turned to, to using drugs and drinking alcohol to fill any kind of void that I felt. Kayla was 25 when the drug use and neglect caught up with her, and she lost custody of all five of her children. I wanted to die, and I, I, hated, I hated who I was. I hated what I had done. I felt like everything that I, I loved was just taken. With her dreams of a family shattered, Kayla left her boyfriend. She still hoped to change, but couldn't break free from drugs. After two years of failing to quit her habit, a friend suggested she try a Christian-based rehab program. It was there she started learning about Jesus. After a couple of months, a visiting pastor came to speak. Kayla finally put it all together. And I don't remember exactly what he was telling us about Jesus that day, or I don't remember even really why I wanted to, but I knew that I wanted to accept him because Jesus was good and he would, he would help me and he was love. And so I accepted Jesus into my heart that day. And then that's when I felt loved and felt like I was just accepted and cared about. And that's when I began my journey to really understand what God can do. Kayla continued her treatment at another program where she found healing and freedom through Jesus Christ. It was there that he just cleaned my heart off and put forgiveness in my heart and put love in my heart. Like the first program, I, I accepted Jesus and I fell in love with Jesus. And then the second program, I got delivered you know, and healed and set free and cleaned off and just became even more in love with Jesus. Kayla has been free from all addictions ever since. She was also awarded visitation rights with her kids, who had all been adopted into loving homes. When I'm with my kids now, I'm teaching them about God, and I'm just encouraging them with the love that God gave me. And now the time that I get to spend with them, I can truly be the woman of God, the mom of God that he wanted in their lives from the beginning. Today, Kayla's married and says God has truly restored her. He's provided for me every single thing. The husband who came into my life, he's provided. My mom being clean and sober, he's provided. Peace in my heart, he's provided. He provides it all. I no longer am searching or trying to make something happen on my own. I'm just trusting him that He'll give me every single thing that I need. Man, I love this story for so many reasons. Uh, I love the friend that stepped out to help Kayla to say, you know, go to this Christian treatment center. She had tried so many other options to get free and to be delivered of addiction. And, and it was when she found Jesus that she found full healing and deliverance from her addictions and all of her brokenness was set free from her. But I just love what Kayla said. She goes, I don't even know why I said yes to Jesus that day. You know, like, I have no clue why I said yes to Jesus. All I know is that he was good. You know, I think that is really sums up the gospel. Jesus is good. He loves you and he has good plans for you. You don't need to be afraid of what Jesus wants for you. He is so good, he is so kind, and all that he gives us is freedom. He said, I came to give you life, and that life more abundantly. Is that what you've been looking for? You know, there's a powerful book, verse in scripture in Proverbs 3, verses five and six. Maybe you, like Caleb, have been looking all over the place. What do I do next? Where do I turn next? Listen to what Proverbs 3, five and six says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, acknowledge the Lord Jesus, and he will make your path straight. He will direct your path, some versions say. You know, God has wonderful plans for your life. And this is the invitation of the gospel when we say yes to what Jesus has done then we call it a new day because it is a brand new day. You become a brand new person just like Kayla. Is that where you are today and you've been looking every place else? Just stop right now and say, Jesus, I know you're good. I believe you're good and I'm running only to you. Take all my brokenness, 
and I receive you in my life, change me. If you pray that, call us right now, 1-855-759-0700. There's good people on the other side of that phone. It's a new day. Up next, for years, William was earning millions. See why the only thing he wants to earn now is respect. And it wasn't unlike me to work, you know, uh, 10 to 12 hour days, five to seven days a week. I could safely say that money became my God. William Searles was in his early 20s when he decided to do whatever it took to make a lot of money and have the things that came with it. I was the guy that had everything. I had the big house, the big job, the big car. Even though he was married and starting a family, his pursuit of the dollar came first. He quickly moved up the corporate ladder. And in time, you know, I went from being Joe Stockbroker to Mr. Senior Vice President with several offices under my control. And with that came lots of money. His wife grew tired of taking a back seat while William built his financial empire. He several times, I mean, you're gonna regret. You know, the day will come. These kids are small, you need to spend time with them. And I kept going and going and going. William's drive to make money had turned into an obsession. And it's, it's, it's a big cycle. And like I said, you get not necessarily just addicted to, to making money, just the things that come with it and the drive to make more. It's like, a, it's like a competition. It's, you know, keep up with the Joneses on steroids. He dismissed the idea that his pursuit of money was ruining his marriage. Then in 2000, the stock market crashed and William lost millions. His reaction was consistent with how he did things. I would say it was almost more like a gambling addiction. And when gamblers lose, they have a tendency to think that you know brighter days are coming and they start chasing. And when I started losing, you know, I was constantly looking for this, for this rebound. William immediately turned his energies to rebuilding his empire. Soon after, his wife left and they divorced. Rightfully so, she had had enough you know, and we parted ways. William's plan to make back the millions he'd lost started out legitimately. But William wasn't making money like he did in the 1990s. So we compromised. And I started borrowing money under false pretenses to reinvest that money. It'd be very easy for me to say, hey, I'm going to borrow some money, pay X interest, make X back in the stock market, and then repay everybody and, and, and go off, you know, until when things return back to normal. They didn't. Still, William continued investing families and friends' money, hoping the market would turn around. But in truth, there would be no payoff. I just got so deep into it, and in order to not hurt one person, I went on and hurt somebody else. And uh, it just absolutely spun out of control to a point where it got to the point of no return. William lost millions of investment dollars. Um, you know, when you, when you take a combination of pride, stupidity, and ego, you know, those, th those three things don't normally set well together. Um, I was very dishonest with a lot of people very, very close to me. He realized it was only a matter of time before authorities would catch up with him. And, you know, I just I got to the point where I had had enough and I just couldn't do it anymore, regardless of what the consequences that I had to stop the train, get off, face the music and, you know, and uh, while doing that, face the consequences. On September 20th, 2006, William turned himself in. He served 52 months in federal prison for wire fraud and money laundering. It gave him time to think about his life and future. But the bomb for me was that William Searles isn't the center of everything. In prison, William met Christians and had questions about Jesus Christ. In time, he started attending a Bible study where he learned about faith. So I kept reading the Bible, reading the Bible, spending more time with Christians, and my faith continued to grow. And I just, you know, to me, faith is that absolute sense of certainty that God is who he is. He's going to do what he says he's going to do. And we all have access to that through a son who died for all of us, even guys in prison. 
Eventually, William gave his life to Jesus Christ. He then started the journey of making things right with those he hurt and accepting God's forgiveness. And once you accept that forgiveness, that's the only forgiveness we'll ever need. But, you know, for me to carry that on, you know, for years was right in these people's faces. Uh, really, it's, it's something I hope, you know, I want to do everything I can to, to earn that respect back. I'm, you know, still in touch with a lot of these people. I've received a lot of forgiveness. But uh, at the same time, um, you know, I want to work hard to, to make everything right. After serving three years, he made amends with his ex-wife and reconciled with his daughters. My relationship with my daughters is better than it's ever been. I told them everything, and, and that was probably the single most difficult conversation I'll ever have in my life. Today, William is a successful author and is in the process of paying back the money he took. While he admits he's not perfect, he puts his entire faith in God. I, I can still consider myself to be a work in progress, and I still struggle with a lot of things from my previous life. Um, I, you know, right now when I wake up every morning, the first thing I do is pray and read my Bible. Automatic. And my relationship with Jesus is more of a, he's walking right beside me. And when I get into these situations, I almost step back, let him step in front of me and say, what would you do here? And don't get me wrong, there's situations where I skip over them and, and make mistakes all the time. But uh, he's right with me. And uh, you know, having him by my side obviously is a, is a huge advantage to where I was before. Get the Transforming Word, Volume 3. Pat Robertson records powerful selections from the Book of Proverbs. The Lord gives wisdom. From His mouth comes knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store for the upright. As you listen to the Transforming Word, Volume 3, you'll be rejuvenated by the anointed Word of God, be inspired by the calming presence of the Lord, and you'll discover God's favor in your everyday life. Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers, and blessed is the one who trusts in the Lord. Partner with CBN to get your copy of Pat's new audio CD, The Transforming Word, Volume 3. Plus, as a special bonus, you'll receive a DVD of Pat's teaching, The Three Blessings. Immerse your mind in the Transforming Word, Volume 3, plus Pat's teaching, The Three Blessings. Available now. A question I often hear from people is, how on earth can you still believe in God? Don't we live in the age of science? And hasn't science utterly disproven God? Hasn't science buried God? Haven't religion and science always been at war with each other? And come on, look at the world we live in. Science has clearly won. Well, the idea that science and religion are at war with one another is, to uh, give it a technical term, a myth. It's known as the, uh, as the conflict thesis, the idea that science and religion have been eternal enemies, and it simply isn't true. Here's an interesting historical uh, fact for you. The founders of modern science, the majority of the, uh, the, the folks who actually carved out the modern scientific method were Christians. They were men of deep religious faith, and you can look back to, uh, to those who did, did that, people like Bacon and, uh, and others, and you can go, these were people who had a deep faith in God. And what's interesting, not merely were they men of religious faith, were they often Christians, when you look into what drove them to, uh, to develop science, it was actually their Christian faith that did so. Why was that? Well, think about this for a moment. To, uh, to be a scientist, to do science, you have to believe in a world that is ordered and regular rather than a world that is chaotic, a world in which the future looks like the past, in which you might expect there to be laws and uh, structures to the universe. Well, what might give somebody that idea? You see, we live in the age of science, we take that for granted, but that hasn't always been the way the world has worked. Many civilizations, for many thousands of years, believed that the universe was essentially chaotic. What led science to begin? Well, it was because the founders of science believed in a God who was regular and consistent and ordered, and thus he had created the universe that way. And so, in a sense, Christianity was not the enemy of science. Christianity was where science was birthed and was the cradle from which science sprang. So the conflict hypothesis is a myth. 
It's also important to recognise that science has limits. It may be one of the best tools that human beings have ever invented, but there are some questions it can't answer. Let me illustrate. Imagine I were to take my friend to perhaps the most famous art gallery in the world, the Louvre in Paris, and we go and see that amazing picture by Leonardo da Vinci, the Mona Lisa, hanging there on the wall. And I turn to my friend and I say, I've always wondered why Leonardo da Vinci painted the Mona Lisa with that enigmatic smile. And my friend says, well, maybe here's what we can do, Andy. We can drug the security guards. And when they've all fallen asleep, what we'll do is we'll shatter the bulletproof glass that protects the picture. We'll scrape some of the paint off the picture and we'll do a chemical analysis. We'll take a sample of the wood and we can use dendrochronology to work out when the tree that was felled that made the wood panel for the picture. And we can do all this battery of scientific tests. I'm a scientist and we can answer your question. I would probably look at my friend a little bit bemused and say, my friend, you're clearly not a scientist, you're a lunatic and a louvre, because all of those scientific tests, helpful as they may be, not one would answer the question I asked. Why did Leonardo paint the Mona Lisa with that enigmatic smile? For that question, we need art history. Science won't help you. In other words, there are some things that science can't answer. It can't answer questions of art history or economics or philosophy or aesthetics or politics or religion. Science wasn't designed to do that. And you have to use a tool for the thing it was designed for. A sledgehammer may be great for breaking rocks. If I start using it to try and paint a picture, I'll be in trouble. But one last thought. Why is it we can do science in the first place? We can do science because we are rational, thinking creatures. But the problem is, if we are just atoms and particles, if there is no God, if all that is going on between my ears right now is a chemical reaction fizzing, why is it that I can even think in the first place? Why is it that I'm conscious? Why do I have a mind? Well, the interesting thing is Christianity answers that question too. We are made in the image of a God who is rational. That's why we have minds. That's why science works. Science is not a weapon that demolishes God, but a signpost that points to him. Hi, I'm Catherine Renala. The Bible says in Hebrews 13:8 that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And today he is still doing miracles. I've seen a little six-year-old girl, completely, profoundly deaf, getting her hearing for the very first time as the Spirit of Jesus touched her. A lady came for prayer who had leukemia, and she said she felt the Holy Spirit just move through her like whirlwinds through her body. When she went back to the doctor a few days later, they discovered that she had completely normal blood. There was no trace of cancer in her system. One lady we prayed for had a six inch tumor wrapped around her pancreas, a, a primary cancer, and the Holy Spirit touched her and delivered her. Now Jesus so wanted us to understand how good the Father is, and that's why he did so many miracles, and that's why he's doing these things today. Jesus explained what the father was like when he shared the story, the parable of the prodigal son. That young man came home after being broke and doing all the things that Jewish boys shouldn't do. To his surprise, the father ran to him the moment he could see him a long way off, wrapped his arms around him, kissed him and embraced him and restored everything to him. This kind of love is not human, it is supernatural and it is the love that God has for us today. Every time you come to Him in faith, the Father is running to you to wrap His arms around you and to love you. Jesus came and He sacrificed His life. He died and He rose again so that if you'll come to Him with your sin, with your shame, and exchange it in faith for His mercy and His righteousness, you can be in relationship with God because that's His highest desire, that you would know Him and experience His great love for you. Respond to the Savior today. He's waiting for you. Jesus said it. I came to give you life, life to the fullest, life in your family, life in your finances, life in your body, mind, and spirit, life in your every day. We're here to help you discover life. Okay, Brian, 
Close your eyes. Now, don't think about a peach. What are you thinking about? I'm just trying to watch what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> you tricked me at the top end of the show. You saw yeah, you had yeah, me. Yeah, when I open. I hate, being out, I hate being out of control, I yeah. have to admit, so. <laughs> I don't mind it as long as I trust the character of the person, mm. right? But uh, you when trust you said me, that, Brian? I do, I really do. All right. But I kept my good eye open too. <laughs> <laughs> Boy, we've learned a lot today about what it means to let go of control, right? Really and yeah. it's so important in our lives. I mean, you know, there's too many things vying for our attention. We just got to let it go and really trust, like you said, the character of God, the yeah. one that we know best. Yeah. Well, and I think that's the way that we begin to move into a place of seeing even a greater reality because yeah. ours is limited, but yeah. in God's hands, it's unlimited. It's true. Yeah. And we want to thank you so much for joining us every day or yeah. as often as you can. Like that thank shows you. you trust us and we are so grateful for that. Please pray for this ministry, yeah. pray for us, pray for the word as it goes out to people that it would actually not fall on hard ground, but it would follow on good yeah. soil. And if you'd consider being a monthly partner with us, uh, $20 or your best gift, um, come on a journey with us and we'll give you this lovely gift the transforming word, uh, Bible reading, really, to wash over your heart and mind, and we'll teach you to let go of control. So give us a call today, 1-855-759-0700. And this whole episode, we've been really focusing on really trusting God. And there's so many times that we do not trust. And when we don't trust, we don't see the fullness. So let's just pray for those that are having struggles yeah. and letting go. You lead this. Okay. Well, Father... We say that you can be in charge of our life. You're a good dad. Yes. You're a good boss. You love us and you have the best plans for us. So we just open our hands and say, we release everything to you. Take charge in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now think Holy Spirit. That's the dominant thought. Mm -hmm. Now God will take control. You know, uh, we're looking forward to a, a great time on Monday and don't want you to miss this because we have a special show that there's going to be an in-studio performance and it's with these three amazing men that have come together, Mark Masary, Ben Utech, and Andre Venter. Now, one, a Super Bowl champion, one, also a rugby champion, and one wanting to go into medicine but has now moved into a whole different career. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be amazing. Wait. Their yeah. music is incredible. Yeah, reborn. Yo, oh, amazing. Thanks for watching us. Until next time, God bless. To contact us, phone 1-855-759-0700. You can email us at cba at 700club.ca or write to us at Christian Broadcasting Associates, Incorporated. The 700 Club Canada, P.O. Box 700, Scarborough, Ontario, M1S4T4. You can now like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter or Instagram.